can be the people we talked about being, with no more worries about how we look or the image we project to people. What matters is what we have on the inside. Hello? It's been a couple months since South Park parodied Harry and Meghan, and it is more true today than ever before, especially when it comes to Meghan Markle and her, her depiction as a hollow, shallow person. Everybody is really, really starting to pick up on this. Even after it's been months, I think it broke maybe in late 2022, very early 2023, that Meghan Markle really didn't interview anybody for her podcast besides the celebrities. People are really picking up on that and running with it. And I think it's an indication wholly that Meghan Markle's victim narrative has completely and utterly fallen apart. Despite all she's done to portray herself as the victim of the British media, the British monarchy, the tabloids, the press, the bee in her garden that won't go away, Meghan Markle has been outed for who she really is, which is a shallow, hollow person who's only able to mimic other things that are great because she's unable to come up with original ideas, content, or even really able to show actual emotion. If you listen through her podcast, it's very apparent how contrived it is. It is very much scripted. Even Megan's laugh sometimes, it's like, oh my gosh, honey, do you have any idea how fake that sounds? Because it was, it was part of a script that said, laugh, here and Megan can't even do that convincingly. And throughout all this, we've also had some really, really interesting breaking news from Valentine Lowe. He wrote The Courtier's book and he has recently added a couple of new chapters. It's a wonderful book. Check it out if you haven't had a chance. I've also interviewed Valentine Lowe before. It was a fantastic interview about this book. And what he revealed basically is that when it comes to responding to the Oprah Winfrey interview and that key line, recollections may vary. It was actually Catherine, the Duchess of Cambridge at the time, who is now the Princess of Wales, who really, really insisted that that little line stand within the version they released to the press. The Her Majesty obviously agreed. And Catherine's reasoning, I think, is very, very sound, and it's why she's triumphed over Meghan Markle. Catherine basically argued that for historical purposes, for their legacy, basically, they had to leave that in there because they could leave not a shadow of a doubt that what Harry and Meghan said were accurate. They had to slip in there very subtly, very carefully, the notion to people that what Harry and Meghan were saying in that interview wasn't entirely accurate. And as we look back now, it seems incredibly apparent how true that was was. And Catherine was right on the money there. So today we're going to go over some other articles that have really laid out who Meghan Markle is and how her victim narrative is gone. It is completely and utterly shredded anymore. She has no leg left to stand on in this area. And we're also going to talk about how Catherine has not only thrived under the relentless assaults from Meghan Markle and has become this really pinnacle of power within the British monarchy, something Meghan desperately wanted but can never achieve. So we're gonna go over those details today. But if you guys haven't been to Royal News Network, my name is Brittany and I provide compelling royal commentary here on this channel. In addition, sometimes I talk about television shows and movies and share a bit about history, all related to royals. So if you're interested in subscribing, I'd like to get to 150,000 subscribers. So I'd absolutely love, love, love to have you back. In addition, I also have a weekly newsletter, Royal Wire. I have a fashion channel and I have an upcoming trip to Germany and Austria and only about a little over two weeks before that trip officially closes. So if you want to go to Munich, Salzburg and Vienna with me, very magical castles and locations. I'd love to have you join me. I'm super, super excited about it. We have 15 people signed up. So I would love to have even more join us. So guys, link for that is in the description box down below. And before we get into Harry and Meghan, some other royal news, we have the Dutch royals who did their annual summer photo call this year, this year on the beach. And it was very, very windy and sort of crazy, but we got some amazing pictures. And Mambo, who is the Royals' dog, she was darling. She was clearly having a blast on the beach <laughs> and just running around and being crazy. So I absolutely love that. I, I should do a whole video at some point about Royal dogs. I've wanted to, and I've wanted to have, because we have 
about five dogs within all the extended members of my family. It would be fun to have them all in one room while I'm trying to give the, a little spiel about the royal puppies because that would just be so unbelievably crazy and fun. Although we did have a little bit of that. I did a live stream from my parents' house. My dog was there, their three dogs were there, and my dog doesn't like one of their dogs. So that was great fun. But when it comes to Megan, oh, oh, oh. It's, it's really surprising when you look at this whole thing in its entirety. Yes, Harry's court case is still going on. They had, I guess we're trying to get some last minute evidence brought in and the judge said no recently, but Harry's doing his court casing over here. And yes, it, it generated some rumbles and everything, but people are mostly letting that lie. They're like, okay, whatever. He's doing his crazy thing over here in the corner. The debacle and the collapse of Spotify. And we've really seen the focus shift from Harry and Spare and everything to a lot of it falling on Megan now, which has been really fascinating to see because Megan almost more than Harry has very much been able to shield herself with this victim narrative that if you say anything bad about Meghan Markle, you are the R word, you are racist. And you still see that a lot on social media, especially on Twitter, I'm on there quite a bit and I see a lot of the posts, but I really feel like that argument has completely and utterly crumbled. It doesn't really work anymore. Megan's shield of any criticism that it's all based on race, it's getting less mileage than it used to. And I would even argue that it has ceased to exist because people are saying, well, oh, it's not about Megan's race, the reason why she failed, because she got everything she wanted really out of this Spotify deal. They built her a studio, she got some famous guests and everything like that. But at the end of the day, it really fell because Archetypes wasn't good, it wasn't interesting, and while Harry, yes, he should have done something, because he didn't, his name is not as closely associated with it. And apparently Megan's team is even desperately trying to drum up interest and perhaps even a bigger deal from other studios. I thought this was interesting from Royal T. They said offers doesn't mean good offers. This is a classic PR strategy to try and drum up excitement for better deals than the ones you currently have on the table. Since her next deal has to meet, exceed the platform and earning potential she had with Spotify. And the problem for Megan is that she will never achieve Spotify levels again. And the reason she's not is because of her. She didn't fulfill them the first time. So you can't really expect them to give you a better deal the second time when the first time you failed so spectacularly. And I know her stands just harp on this time and time again. Oh, she was the number one podcast in the world. I'm like, guys, she was just the number one podcast on Spotify at that moment. And she didn't even have the top three episodes. You need to let this go. And then they remark, well, she won awards. And I'm like, well, anybody can win awards. You, you honestly, a lot of them are paid for it if you didn't know that. If you didn't know that, I feel sorry for you that you actually believe she won these. And through merit alone, because even the People's Choice Award that she won, guess what was not on the ticket? Joe Rogan, who does have the number one podcast in the world. If Joe Rogan was on that ticket, Megan wouldn't have had a chance. So Megan Markle's whole veneer, the whole media empire and narrative that she tried to create for herself has completely dissipated on her. And she really only has herself to blame. And everyone's picking up on this. Everyone. You see article after article after article talking about these debacles, talking about how Harry and Megan failed, but really going after Megan in a lot of ways. And they're really criticizing her on things that we have talked about in this community for a long time, that she's vain, vapid, shallow, that she doesn't really put any effort into anything, that she doesn't really have any talent, and that her podcast just wasn't good, and that her victim narrative that she's been this victim of this horrific racist machine well, it doesn't really stand up if you look at things closely. She got everything she wanted, and yet she still failed to bring stuff to the finish line. And that's not on the public, that's not on the British press, that's on the royal family. That's on Meghan Markle. And yes, Harry didn't fulfill his end of the Spotify deal, but Meghan really did become the face of their Spotify agreement. And because of that, she is facing, I think, really the most criticism, the most analysis on why this collapsed because there's no reason in the world they should have lost this deal. No reason at all. It is a layup. They just had to basically produce 
content, compelling content. And I do it all the time with a one woman show. I have ideas for podcasts. I have ideas for series I want to do. I just don't have the time, but I have so many ideas that if I had a team of close to 30 staff members helping me like Megan did with her podcast. Oh, you betcha guys. We'd be churning out content all the time. We'd be covering Royal events like this whole photo call with the Dutch. It was hard for me cause I was at home going, I wish I was there. And then I could have asked them a question in English cause they answered everything in Dutch. But I think it's great. One of my passions is showing Americans and basically other people around the world who focus on the Brits a lot. Hey, there's all these other Royals out there too. And look at them. They're so cool. They're so interesting as well. You just don't hear about them quite as much. And part of that is just simply the language barrier. But Meghan Markle had the biggest platform in the world. And she had all the resources that you could dream of and she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it because we all know Harry is dumb as a bag of bricks. This is becoming more and more apparent how dumb he is. I, I hate to say it that way because that's I'm not trying to put him down, but he is not a smart guy. He's not. And it's funny too because he's aware of how dim people think he is. And so he's trying to push back against that. And it's, you just always feel like it's not going well for him because even his own ghost author said Harry had some sort of comeback to the soldiers that were needling him during a hostage exercise. So they, they took him hostage and were trying to train him how to react. And he had this comeback that he thought was so good. And his ghostwriter says it was very inane, which means silly, which means it really wasn't as smart as Harry was thinking it was. And his ghost author, the poor guy, is trying to just temper Harry's expectations. Go, yeah, no, let's not put this in there because really it doesn't help you. And Harry just didn't really get that. But it was just fascinating to see how much focus is going on Megan here because Megan has felt for so long to be bullet proof that you couldn't say anything against her. And you felt that with even within the industry, but that is gone. That is gone. And even people or organizations outlets that you wouldn't think would talk about Harry and Megan are, and they're identifying some really, really interesting things. So here's one from the free press, which is Barry Weiss's platform on Substack. So she was basically the New York times author. I can't remember quite how everything came together, but she started, she was one of the first big people on Substack. And so here's what one of her writers wrote. It wasn't her, but one of her writers. She said, here's the funny thing about Americans. We love a spectacle. We love a popper to princess story. We love a betrayed prince who finally found love, but we also cherish the idea of family and even more hard work. But this month, when we learned that Megan didn't even conduct interviews with non-famous people for her podcast, it's what made us finally give up on them. Not just because they were revealed as lazy entitled dilettantes, but because they inadvertently showed themselves for who they really are, snobs. And Americans really, really don't like snobs. I love that line. Meghan Markle is an insufferable snob. She doesn't want to deal with anybody who she deems below her. This is why there were those bullying allegations against her, which she does for the record, strongly deny through her lawyers that she did not bully anybody. But those accusations were very serious and they encompassed a lot of people because to Meghan, anybody who is beneath her is basically a speck of dirt on her shoes. She wants to trample all over them. She demands things of them. For royals and their staff members, there's a very much a symbiotic relationship because yes, you do need to manage these people and hold these people accountable for the job that they do. Yet at the same time, the royal family is very different in that it is a family. So there are family dynamics at play. And there's also a thing where because you are so exposed to the world, I think you do develop a very close relationship with some of your staff members because they're the only ones who really see you probably sometimes in a rather vulnerable moment. It's because they see you, they talk to you right after the Oprah Winfrey interview, helping you address the issues that were brought up in it. And so it's very, very complex in a lot of ways and very, very challenging. And so I think there's a very close bond that develops in a way that other staff members don't. And Harry and Meghan did not treat their staff members well. Basically, they had a massive amount of turnover within six months to a year of them becoming royals. And that turnover has continued into Archwell as well. 
Omid Scobie, the, mm, who many royal reporters just refer to as Meghan Markle's cheerleader, who says, well, there was some turnover in Catherine's private sectories. Why does nobody look into that? It's been over six years and she's had a couple. It's like, well, yeah, but Harry and Meghan go through the same staff person every year. Between when I was looking at their Archwell 990, it seemed like basically everybody listed as a staff member was gone except for one person. So these people have a constantly high staff turnover. And for William and Catherine, they hire very competent people from the government oftentimes, and perhaps they're elevated. Prince William's former private secretary Simon Case became a cabinet minister. So these people have very high profile roles and sometimes they're pulled from government institutions and sometimes Catherine and William have to let them or they decide they want to do this for a little bit of time and then move on to something else because it's high pressure, there's a lot of eyes on you and it doesn't really generally pay that well. So that's the little bit of secret about being a royal staff member is it doesn't pay super, super well. But the advantage is if you retire on really, really good terms, you might get a grace and favor home. You might be able to live in some of the apartments in Kensington Palace, in a Hampton Court Palace, maybe even in Buckingham Palace, probably not Clarence House, that's too small. St. James's Palace, something like that. There might be some places where you actually, as a staff member, get to live on a palace property. Windsor Castle would be another option. So there's a lot of great opportunities there as you grow into these royal roles. But Harry and Meghan, again, the staff turnover with them is just exceedingly, exceedingly high. And so then we have this other article from Unheard, which I also thought really, really caught on and narrowed onto the aspect of Meghan's personality that I think sometimes is skipped over, which South Park very much highlighted and laser focused on, which is that Meghan Markle is hollow. She mimics other people and their successful endeavors because she can't do it on her own. She does not have the basis to actually create original and interesting content. She can't do it. So here's some of what we got from there. It says the archetypes post-mortem has included damning allegations about Megan's lack of involvement, including that she pawned off the actual interviewing onto a producer and then recorded herself asking questions later. Andy Cohen, the host of Real Housewives, who appeared in the final binary breaking episode, so-called because unlike previous episodes, this one had men in it, has described this as an insane rumor. From the perspective of a famous person, like him, it is, it's very clear, listening to the podcast, that Megan did indeed interview her celebrity guests. It's equally clear, however, that these are the only guests she talked to. And yes, if you listen to it, which I have listened to it, it's grating, it's annoying, it's not a great podcast, but you can very clearly tell that it's, it's very scripted. It's very it's very contrived in a way. Yes, you have the conversation with the celebrity, but they pop in other interviews with so-called with experts to, I guess, make what they're talking about sound better or something. It's just hard to tell. And so Megan will come in, say a little thing, and this person talks. And it's very clear that Megan didn't really ask the question to that person. It was the producer. And one of the people who was interviewed did confirm that. And of course, Meghan Markle only talks to celebrities because those are the only people she cares about. Of course, Meghan is very busy and important and not obligated to talk to anyone she doesn't want to. Of course, she's entitled to only speak with people as famous as she is while leaving her producers to deal with the rabble. But this is undeniably at odds with the relatable image she's been attempting to sell since Megxit, whether it's one-on-one -on -one one with Oprah or to millions of viewers on Netflix. The image of a royal princess turned humble truth teller. Megan, who lest we forget started out as an actor, is not so much an engaged host as playing the role of one. And hence archetypes is not so much a podcast as an incredible simulation thereof. You know that saying about a stupid person's idea of a smart person? This is like that, except it's a narcissist idea of what it would be like to be curious about other people's lives. When news broke this week, Harry's own favorite, albeit sadly unrealized podcast idea was to interview Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump about their childhood trauma. Was anyone surprised? At the end of the day, the Sussexes invariably circle back to the only topic either of them are interested in themselves. This author hit the nail on the head. Meghan Markle is not interested in anybody else, anybody's life, anybody's experiences, but Meghan Markle's. She doesn't care. She could care less about what happens in your life. 
And we've heard this from people who have been connected with Suits and stuff. There was that interesting interview with a woman who knew some people from Suits talking about how you could talk to Megan and she would ask you questions about your life, but you could also tell she didn't really care. And so take a listen to this little bit real quick. But a large number of the people in Suits sort of didn't like jive with her. And somebody said like, She's just not somebody you can be friends with. You can go on a hike with her through the Hollywood Hills and she'll ask you about your family. She'll be very nice, but you never actually get to know this person. Like, you can't touch her. You can't get through the glass. So Megan definitely somebody she, who tries to mimic other people, other people's emotions, other people's interests, because she has fundamentally no interest at all. And she can't necessarily fake it well either. She's not a great actress. So not only can she not do it to begin with, she's not even good at faking it. And because of that, everything about Harry and Meghan constantly funnels back to themselves because that's the only thing they know and it's the only thing they care about. This is, if nothing else, a solid business strategy. The relentless commitment to monetizing one's own life story is itself archetypal of the modern age, not to mention classically American. And despite the entertainment value of Bill Simmons describing the couple as grifters, this is not quite the word for what Megan is, nor for what she tried to do with her now defunct podcast. Grifters are typically in it for the money. But the nature of the Spotify contract more or less meant that she could have farted into a microphone for an hour and still get paid. But Archetypes is what she made. She chose the podcast medium. She chose this particular format. Perhaps it is worth asking why. Is it just this type of vaguely woke social commentary is cheap and easy and ubiquitous? The lowest hanging drew on today's cultural landscape? Or is it that in our attention economy, wading into the shallowest point in the culture wars where the activism of the keyboard warriors meets the relatability of the lifestyle influencer, it's one of the few ways left to make a name for yourself that doesn't involve reality television. <laughs> oh, oh. That is bad. Yes, Meghan Markle, basically, it's it's the lowest common denominator. Yes, Meghan Markle waded into the shallowest waters here. What she was talking about on her podcast it was somewhat an interesting idea, yet at the same time, I feel like those issues were addressed in the 60s and the 70s. They're not really as much issues now. And when she was even interviewing Mariah Carey, she was coming at it from the perspective that being called a diva was something negative. And Mariah's like, I don't care if anybody calls me a diva, I am a diva. I completely own this. Honey, you're a diva. And Meghan Markle had a complete and utter meltdown because Mariah Carey dared to call her a diva because Mariah is, you could say, even a more modern woman than Meghan Markle because she doesn't see it as an issue anymore. We think of Jennifer Lopez as a diva. Does J-Lo probably care that anybody thinks she's a diva? Probably not because she's making millions upon millions of dollars. So she doesn't really care. In fact, most of them own it. Meghan Markle, though, she can't see beyond her own narcissism. She can't see beyond her own issues. And because of that, she's become obsessed with herself. She's obsessed with her own delusions of grandeur and her own art narcissism and her own failure. And she goes to something that is so middling and weak because she is a middling and weak person herself. She has no depth to wade into true culture wars over, you could say, the transgender issue. Did she come out strongly on either side of that? No, that is really getting in too deep into the culture wars. Mary, Megan was talking about something that most people feel like has been settled for the last couple of decades. And so nobody was interested. But it was an avenue for Megan to talk about her favorite subject, herself. Megan! The problem in the end is not Megan's story. It's Megan herself, a hallmark of the best podcast. And what is sorely missing from archetypes is a sense of intimacy. The content of an enjoyable podcast is often secondary to the connection you feel to it. Whether it's a sense of sitting in on a lecture from an expert who is passionately obsessed with his subject, as in my favorite murder or the rest is history, or of overhearing a conversation between interesting people who are also interested in each other as in blocked and reported or the unspeakable. To be clear, archetypes failed for not lack of trying. Megan dutifully mimics the format of other, better podcasts, leaning into the microphone and addressing the audience in direct and confessional tone. But these moments are so obviously scripted in the sense that a practical actress with a trained voice is reading lines off a page that they ring 
hollow. The overall impression is of somebody who knows all the words but can't hear the music. A person more concerned with the image than the connection. A woman who wants to present herself as relatable while speaking only to people as famous as she is. It's ironic for someone who fled the UK to escape the constraints of a highly managed life. She seems more boxed in than ever. Ooh, that is sharp. But again, incredibly, incredibly accurate because I noticed the same thing that when you actually listen to the podcast, it's, it's, it's choppy in a way. There's no natural flow of conversation. So I would think in most instances when you're talking about these issues that Megan would, let's say, start off with talking to the expert and then move on to Mariah Carey, Serena Williams or whoever else. But instead, Megan has this long intro about herself. <laughs> <laughs> then she talks maybe a little bit to the 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 celebrity guests and then a little bit to the so-called expert and then a little bit more on the celebrity and it, it's so choppy that it just doesn't even feel fun or interesting because conversation is key here that's why oprah winfrey was so successful you can like or hate oprah winfrey it doesn't matter she was enormously successful because she could have conversations with people Meghan markle cannot if it doesn't directly reference or is obsessed with herself she cannot have even the guests she did have the celebrity guests she would interrupt them and tell them stories about herself. And yes, that is somewhat part of conversations when you get to know people. At the same time, once again, it came across to people as something where, okay, are you really interviewing them to get their story or to talk about yourself? Is it part of a greater narrative about the roles that sometimes hold women back? Or is it really a vehicle for you to talk about your favorite subject? Meghan Markle and that she's the Duchess of Sussex. Yes, that is apparently all Megan cared about. And that people, again, are highlighting this shows how much the veneer, the shield that Megan has used against the broader public is gone. It's gone now. She can't really use it anymore. Her stand even really can't use it anymore. It's no surprise that Megan was drawn to the idea of podcasting, the dream of a conversation over which she has total control. But for archetypes to work, its hosts would have to recognize that the point of interviewing other people is to tell their story, not to use them as a vehicle for telling and retelling your own. But even Megan's dialogues with celebrity guests have a funny way of circling back to become all about Megan herself, her Cinderella story, her identity struggles, and her yearning to be affirmed and accepted, first by Hollywood and then by the royals. And here, though evidently without meaning to, the podcast does manage to fulfill its promise on one front. If you're looking for a 12 hour portrait of the archetypal narcissist, you cannot find one better than this. Oh, oh yes. Meghan Markle is a narcissist. She is a huge narcissist. She really only cares about herself. And you can see this obviously even in her relationship with Harry. It's all about her wants, her needs, her desires, her future, what she wants for her, the kids, not what he wants. Maybe he wants to spend time with his family, but oh no, no, no. Megan does doesn't want that. What Megan wants, Megan gets. And when they use that term, obviously it came out around the time, I think in November, 2018, after they had gotten married, they tried to push against that. In an interview Harry was like, Oh, what is that? I don't know what that is. It's like, well, Harry, we all see it now. What Megan wants, Megan gets to her own detriment. This podcast thing is a failure and it's a failure on Megan Markle completely on Meghan Markle. Meghan perhaps could have saved her and Harry's relationship with Spotify. If she had a podcast that was good, maybe they still needed to work with him, but if her podcast was good, if it was making gangbusters in the ratings, they would keep it. They let it go because it wasn't worthwhile to keep. We've see, even seen this with some streaming services. Willow, a show that was produced by Lucas Films, was dropped from Disney Plus after being on there only six months because it was more expensive to keep that show on there and pay residuals to the actors than was to take it off. So that show was only live for about six months. They've done this in a couple others. One was regarding Amy Schumer. They pulled it off because it was more expensive to pay Amy Schumer to keep it on there than would be to take it off and eat the whatever loss they needed to eat. Because when things aren't successful, at some point you just got to pull the plug regardless of how powerful the person is. And that's the case here with Megan. And again, they would have kept this. 
Her stands keep going, well, it won awards, it was number one. Well, then why didn't they keep it? It's because of this reason. And at the end of the day, the person who comes out of this on top, the person who comes out of this with the most power, I think, in the situation is Catherine, the Princess of Wales, because she has really triumphed over Meghan Markle in this situation, particularly because she was behind keeping in some recollections may vary. Again, the shirt. And she kept this in for a key reason, which Valentine Lowe goes into in, a, in an excerpt from the additional chapters he's added to his book, Courtiers, which was very, very good. Highly recommend it goes through the Queen and Charles. And it was very, very interesting, these relationships that they have, because you very much see, to a certain extent, the medieval model acted out in modern times. Yes, nobody's about to lose their head. But these are still relationships and power struggles that happen within these palaces. Everybody's jockeying for their position. They're jockeying for their influence in ways. And Catherine has come into this situation after a long time of dating William, playing the long game. Because if you are marrying into the royal family, that's what you, what you must play, is a long game. Now, if you are Catherine, you will be queen. Yes, you still play the long game, but you are also somebody who will be on top one day. It'll just take a little bit, but she'll get there. But you really see here where Catherine had an eagle eye for the fact that if this wasn't in there, people could think what Harry and Meghan were saying was true. And the monarchy through their statement after the Oprah Winfrey interview had to leave that seed, had to let the seed fester that what Harry and Meghan said, or a lot of it, small portion of it, whatever you think, wherever you are on the spectrum of what they said in the Oprah Winfrey interview being true, not true. I've always said that about only five to 10% of it was true, that it let the people see that maybe what Harry and Meghan were saying wasn't entirely accurate. And two years down on the line, I think that that little phrase not only has become iconic, but it's become huge in terms of letting everybody know when it comes to Harry and Meghan, their recollections are different than pretty much everybody else's. So hear what Valentine Lowe says. While many have attributed recollections may vary to Alderton, this is King Charles's private secretary, more than one source has said that the author was in fact Jean Christophe Gray, William's new private secretary, who had been in the post for less than three weeks. At least two senior officials in that other household were against its inclusion because they feared it would rile Harry and Meghan. But once a phrase had been added to the draft, it was, according to another source, the Duchess of Cambridge, who pressed home the argument that it should remain. It was Kate who clearly made the point. History will judge this statement. And unless this phrase or a phrase like it is included, everything that they have said will be taken as true. This was, said the source, yet another example of how Kate is often far steelier than she appears. She does not get as much credit as she should because she is so subtle about it. She is playing the long game. She has always got her eye on, this is my life and my historic path, and I'm going to be queen one day. The toughened updraft went to Buckingham Palace for approval, and it came back a couple hours later. The queen had said yes. That is powerful. Catherine gets it. Catherine gets not only this historic role she has and the influence that she has, but that Harry and Meghan's version of the truth was not the truth. And the palace could not let that stand because it was, I think, a more a genial statement at the beginning. But the palace had to leave that sleep, that sliver of doubt in people's minds about Harry and Meghan. And two years on, we see they were exactly Right, Harry and Meghan's recollections on things completely vary from pretty much everybody else involved in the situation. And even their stands are trying to change up the narrative about this Spotify failure, saying, oh, it was great, it was great. But they don't really answer the question of, well, why did Spotify drop them? What was the issue? They don't really have a good answer for that because obviously recollections may vary. And Spotify, I think, through various statements and leaks to the media, made it very clear that it was a lack of content and a lack of work ethic that really did kill the deal and that they just could not produce enough content. And content is king in these situations. You need to be able to produce things. And Meghan Markle couldn't do it. Harry definitely could not do it. And so the, the deal ended up failing. And at the end of the day, even though Megan desperately sees herself as competing on the same level as Catherine, Catherine has triumphed over her. In so many ways, Catherine is 
succeeding. She has this grand triumph over Meghan Markle and she wasn't seeking it. She was just aware of given everything that's going on, she needs to secure not only her spot and her husband's spot on the throne, but her children's future as well. And so she's going to do everything she can to shield her family. And she did it in a very clever, but very clear way as well. And I think Megan is just reeling from everything falling apart around her. Everything is collapsing on Harry and Megan. And it looks like Netflix is not far behind Spotify. So I don't think Megan will ever fully recover from this. And if she is fielding offers from whoever, I imagine they are half or less than what she got from Spotify because she will never get that kind of money again because she had one shot and she blew it. And as time has gone on, that victim narrative that they desperately clung to has completely and utterly crumbled. She is no longer bulletproof. You can no longer be called racist for criticizing Meghan Markle. You're just called somebody who sees right through her, who identifies a narcissist in our midst, who is desperate for fame, fortune, and attention. So guys, let me know what you think. Let me know what you think of Catherine being responsible for keeping in recollections may vary. I think that's fabulous here. I appreciate you guys so much. I said in a statement on my community post, and it's still true that I will be busy the next week or so at my sister's wedding. So I won't be able to do quite as much content. So hopefully nothing big happens because if it does, I will be very disappointed because I'll have to try to figure out how to work it in. So guys, again, thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye.